If you ever heard the phrase, if you don't know where you're going, you're not gonna make any progress, then I would add to that, if you don't know where you're starting from, you're not gonna make much progress either. In handstands, knowing your starting point and your end goals and the different landmarks that will get you there are extremely important to ensure that we are on the right tracks towards what we want to achieve and to stay motivated and join the process along that enjoyable, but sometimes a bit frustrating journey. What's up everyone? This is Vincent Viz from the Hanson Academy. And today we have a bit of a nerdy video in which we're gonna take stocks about your handstand so that you can pin down what your priorities are. This is a simplified model of what I would use to assess the skills of my online students. And it should give you an idea with very tangible numbers of where you are at and therefore what should be the main meal of your training sessions and ensure that you're not wasting your time on things that are either too easy or too hard for you, which is one of the best ways we have to waste our time and energy. Knowing our starting point is important for two reasons. One, by having different variables that you're gonna track the progress of along the weeks and month of this year, you will ensure that the training program you're following is adequate to your needs, that you actually are progressing, even though you don't quite yet have the magical freestanding handstand of your dreams. A freestanding handstand or a complex freestanding handstand, depending on where you are at on that journey, is a long process. You're planting the seeds in January and you're watering them and feeding the soil for months until you start seeing the first leaf growing off the ground. In those first months of patience in which you diligently do the work, you won't see much result if you only look at whether or not there is a tree growing here. So you have to pay attention to the roots. You have to pay attention to the right variables. And if you don't, you're likely to change your training regimen when it wasn't warranted, when you were actually about to blossom freestanding and you change what you're doing and next thing you know, you're taking two steps backward. You're also likely to get frustrated. If we only look at the end result and we don't acknowledge all the other things that are getting better, all the foundations that you are solidifying in the process, you will be tempted to quit. Keeping track of the proper metrics is a great way to establish landmarks on your way to your end goal that you will achieve and that you will need to celebrate so that when you find yourself in the pit of despair, wondering why on earth you are insisting with this thing called handstands, you can just look back at your note and realize that indeed you've been making progress and maybe that leaf is on the verge of appearing. To Tech Talks, we're gonna start talking about a freestanding handstand. And this may already sound quite daunting for the more beginner amongst you, but this is what's gonna dictate what we are going to assess. We're gonna call this freestanding consistency. And your mission is to kick up in the middle of the room with no wall whatsoever behind you. You are forbidden from being far from the wall, but still with something behind you. Because when you're doing this, you know that the wall is their worst case scenario. Now I need us to see if we can commit to a freestanding handstand. You're gonna kick up 10 times. In those 10 reps, you will have different results. Maybe you are able to overshoot and bail out of a handstand. Maybe you are not able to overshoot and you, and you find yourself undershooting again and again and again. Maybe you are able to catch one, two, three seconds. Maybe you already have achieved the five second landmark. Maybe you are pushing things closer to 10 seconds already. If you can catch a few seconds, the way I want you to do it is, you're gonna draw 10 lines and put a number next to each line, all the way up from one to 10. That's your 10 attempts. You are going to rest in between each attempt. You don't need to be doing them one after the other. You want to treat each attempt as a personal max. So as if you were lifting as heavy as you can and then putting the weight down and then resting to go for it again. You, will, you would, in that context, easily wait a couple of minutes. Same idea here, you want to wait at least 20, 30, if not 60 seconds in between reps. On that list, when you have a successful attempt, you want to write the number of seconds that you held it. When you do not manage to hold it, but you fail overshot, 
you want to put a cross and write overshot. When you didn't manage to hold it and you never committed far enough, you kind of came back down to the floor, you want to put a cross and write undershot. Back to the first scenario, when you're holding it for a few seconds, you want to write if you fall forward or backwards at the end of that hold, in case there's a pattern emerging here. And at the end of this assessment, you should have an average duration, if there is any hold there, with maybe a pattern that starts appearing in terms of falling forward or backwards, losing balance forward or backwards. You have a consistency rate that is over 10 reps. How many times do you manage to balance? And you have an overshooting rate, which is out of 10 reps, how many times did you manage to go far enough? If in that assessment, you end up being able to balance 10 seconds or more, 70% of the time, you have achieved what we call in the Hanson Academy, the freestanding freedom standard. Great, you are an intermediate. At that stage, you need to assess more complex things, such as isometric holds for the press, tended holds for the one arm, number of positions we can do back to back in a sequence for the shape shifting, precision of the alignment, max freestanding hold, max anchored holds, and other variables that we can discuss in another video. But many of you, if not most of you watching this, will not have achieved that standard. And so this is where observing other metrics will become very relevant because by assessing other elements, other pillars of the handstand puzzle, we can start understanding why we're not catching as many overshot handstands as we want or catching as many seconds as we wish, as consistently as we wish. We are now going to take this to the wall. I'm gonna ask you to kick up against the wall. You're gonna remember from the rocket course all the progressions we have back to the wall. And I want you to assess either if you're landing on the wall consistently, and if so, if you can softly land on the wall consistently. Same idea, you wanna rest in between reps, you wanna kick up in your position of choice with your kick up of choice, and you wanna tell me at the end of that, out of 10 reps, how many of them you managed to land, either at all or softly. At the end of this assessment, you will have a back to the wall landing consistency rate and a back to the wall soft landing consistency rate. Remember we what we have said about the kick up in the rocket? Until you get to a point where you can land softly against the wall seven times out of 10 or more, you do not deserve to stop working on your kick up you should still work on your kick up and your kick up only in your training sessions, separate from the balancing part. Then we're gonna assess our balancing capacity back to the wall. That means we're gonna land on the wall and using ideally our fingers and our fingers only, we're gonna take off the wall and try to balance there for as long as we can, all the way up to 10 seconds. Interestingly enough, for you, those of you who can balance freestanding five, 10 seconds or more, you will observe that balancing that same duration with the wall usually feels harder, which is paradoxical because we have fewer things to mind with the wall. We can set ourselves up in a better alignment than the one we end up having at the end of a somehow chaotic kickup. And yet, because the wall is also taking a few elements that we can use for standing away from our toolbox, our performance ends up sometimes suffering from this. However, I will remind you that if you want, if you are working on breaking the 10 second ceiling consistently, I need to see those 10 seconds happening here. And more of this is not gonna cut it. We need to take things back to the wall. We need to have a honest assessment here. So we're gonna kick up against the wall in a viable alignment. And we're gonna push on our fingers and balance off the wall here for as long as we can using our fingers. And as was was saying, all the way up to 10 seconds. If within the first three to five seconds, you find yourself having fallen back to the wall, well, then I want you to slightly tweak this exercise. 
Instead of aiming for 10 seconds off the wall, what we want to pay attention to is the number of time our foot finds the wall again. So the number of ping pong that happen when you're trying to perform a max hold. So we're gonna rather take off the wall and hold it there for 10 to 15 seconds. And as much as you can, you're gonna try to hold yourself off the wall. But whenever your foot finds the wall, which is the signal that you may have lost this free standing, you're gonna count that as one rep, one fall, one touch. And you wanna count the number of falls that you have within 15 seconds. So that week by week, you try to reduce the number of falls, let's say from five to four to three, within a 15 second window. This creates a smaller goal, more achievable, and allows us to bridge the gap between what we can do in terms of ping pongs and what we can do in terms of max hold. Now you know what's coming, I also want you to finish this assessment with chest to the wall hold. So we're gonna go chest to the wall, same idea. If holding five seconds is impossible, we're gonna try to fight for 15 seconds and see how many times we fall back down to the wall and can count that number. Ideally, you may wanna ask a spotter to be here because you're likely to make the mistake this way as well. And so whenever your foot, either leg, falls against the spotter or falls against the wall, that counts as one. And within 10 or 15 seconds, you're gonna count the number of times you felt the partner or the wall, and that number wants to be reduced week by week, month by month. If three to five seconds is achievable, then you go for a max hold all the way up to 10 seconds, and we do that three times, and we have a, an average at the end of that. Of course, this is only applicable if we can take off the wall at all, and if this is too soon, then we may want to swap that for, for now, a hold in which the foot stays light against the wall and build up duration in that position that still feels safe. 